So for those of you who don't know me, and I think that pretty much that accounts for just about everybody in the room, um, I am Stephen Granger. I'm responsible for MasterCard's cross-border payments business. Um, and that's something that we, you know, that's a, we've embarked on a strategy really over the course of the last two to three years to work through what is MasterCard's role beyond card. Now, we'll come and talk a little bit later about, you know, some of the acquisitions we've made and how they help to define that future. But I thought I'd start a little bit with a bit of a play on our great logo. So, um, so on the right-hand side, we started from a place where you know, we are, we've defined ourselves by card. Um, actually, over the last couple of years, we've tried to define ourselves less by card. We've put lower, we've put, removed the emphasis from the C. We've actually now got to the point where we don't talk about MasterCard at all. It's just a symbol. It's just a brand. Um, but what I think is important is you know, where we start from this place of card, as you think about cross-border money moving, you think about money transfer, we know that card has a limited role to play. Right? Card cannot be the answer for how we go to service, not just P2P remittances, but the broader B2B opportunity that lies in front of us as well. So on that realization, you get to the point quite quickly of determining you need new rails. Um, and what we've been trying to do over the course of the last couple of years is through various acquisitions, is to put in place a set of capabilities that allow us to be able to come to market to offer a new set of rails, whether that's real-time payments infrastructure, whether that's money transfer capabilities, whether that's the ability to be able to support you know, broader commerce, broader trade, you know, that's, that is very much at the center of how we think about the development of this cross-border payments franchise. Now, if I bring that together, the really unique opportunity that a company like MasterCard has is how we marry up you know, what we, the place where we came from and the, and the overlay of these new services that we're developing and these new rails. And they lead to some really exciting opportunities and, and lead us to be able to think about new ways to be able to think about money transfer. So, you know, one of the things that we announced in the press earlier this year, and this isn't going to be, this isn't a, a sales pitch for MasterCard, but, you know, as a way to demonstrate one of those things that we're thinking about in Canada with Interac, we announced that, that they are going to build out to our cross-border payment service. And through that domestic real-time channel, you're a customer in Canada through their bank will be able to initiate a cross-border transfer through that domestic channel. That's pretty huge. Um, you know, and it's the first time that we've engaged in that. We're working through right now how do we build that cross-border capability into the core underlying infrastructure that Vocalink provides for real-time payments. But we really do believe that the, the the opportunity that we have as a firm is, is encapsulated in the, in the overlap of, uh, of where these two new rails and, and, and our, our core and our new sets of services come together to deliver opportunity, reach, and impact. Now, it's interesting, Mo, here what you said about Western Union, because, you know, for the most part, we are a, we're a white label firm. You know, put card to one side. In almost anything else you see, you don't see the MasterCard brand. You know, we're a technology, you know, we're increasingly evolving from being a card processing company to a technology company. So when I got the email yesterday that said, it's okay to wear jeans, I was thinking, that's great. You know, you know finally, I'm gonna get to go present somewhere um, where I might fit in. Um, a year ago, just over a year ago, I worked for Swift, based in New York. Had I been here working for Swift, I've been here with my tie, with my suit. Not that there's anything wrong with wearing a tie and a suit at all, by the way. But it's a reflection, really, I think, of where of the changing face within MasterCard, how it sees its, itself evolving from being this card company to a payments company to a technology company. The opportunity in front of us is really how do we leverage the assets that we have to drive most value to our stakeholders and, ultimately, to our shareholders. So what have we been busy doing? And what is it that is in the, what have we been doing to, to, to develop these new rails? So, you know, when we started on this journey three years ago, MasterCard acquired Vocalink, which at the time, you know, was, was predominantly the, the infrastructure for the UK payments business, providing, providing you know, batch capabilities, real-time payment capabilities, 
ch credit check and clearing, you know, that's evolved over that period of time to now becoming the infrastructure for TCH in the US, for Fast in Singapore, for, you know, for prompt pay in Thailand, to now, you know, if you think about, you know, countries that are working towards the development of real-time infrastructures, Peru, the Dominican Republic, you know, there are, a, there are an increasing number of jurisdictions that are taking a look at, you know, what do their underlying rails look like? How do they need to evolve? And what, and, and that creates opportunity for us to be able to work through the delivery of that set of capability. Transfast is, resonates a lot, not just for this audience, but, you know, how do you connect the ability? How do you connect those infrastructures? Um, how do you provide the ability to be able to operate seamlessly across borders? You know, cross border has been something that is really very much at the heart of what MasterCard is. You know, 40, 50 years ago, you know, there were a whole series of domestic schemes that existed across jurisdictions. Really, the role of MasterCard and of Visa was to actually create an overarching cross-border scheme to allow individuals to be able to use their card across different jurisdictions when they traveled. So, and that still is very much at the core of how we think about our business and cross-border is very important to actually the identity of both of both of those organizations and particularly MasterCard. Now, Transfast, give, Transfast opens up another interesting facet about our business. For a long time, we've talked about the war on cash. Um, we've talked about the opportunity being on card, you know, still the vast number of transactions take place in cash. You know, that is our land grab. That's our place to go and grow our business. So then we buy Transfast, right? Transfast not only has an agent solutions business in the US, but more interestingly, I think, it has an extensive cash out network across the globe. And when we take a look at really, I think, at the core of what our customers care about, you know, that's why I say the answer is not purely about card. The answer is not purely about transfer to an account or transfer to a wallet, transfers into cash, cash out remains a really important component of how customers want to do business, how their customers want to be able to transfer money. So, uh, and, and where it really resonates back for MasterCard is in the work that Mike Froman's doing on, in the MasterCard Foundation. What is our role? How can we leverage the assets and the capabilities that we have to drive benefit into into economies that have been, the, you know, into the poorest economies or into countries which have been hit by natural disaster, you know, where do we, where do we apply our efforts in that humanitarian, in that humanitarian cause? Increasingly, as much as we might like to issue a card, people still need cash, right? And most often in those jurisdictions, the ability to be able to get cash to somebody and put cash in somebody's hand is really important. So, you know, we are embracing the assets that we've acquired through Transfast. We're working through the integration of them into our overarching cross-border payment services business. Um, and it will be a key cornerstone of what that looks like as we go forward. Next, we recently announced the acquisition of, not only is it a, another real-time payment infrastructure, but it provides a huge range of of overlay services and applications that sit on top of those rails, particularly in areas like bill pay um, and beyond. And, and the same with Trans Transactus. Transactus is another bill, bill pay proposition that allows us to be able to really develop core services on top of those real-time payment rails. So, so why are we doing all that? What is, what is driven us? That we, it's not just an opportunity to go and spend our shareholders' money. Um, it's because actually the world that we operate in is very different now, right? We, we operate in, our customers operate in an on-demand world, right? Now, the title of this presentation was, you know, getting towards a frictionless future. Friction in this business is actually pretty valuable. You know, if I were, if I, if we were doing this in, in Africa, in Cape Town, we'd extol the virtues of friction and, and what friction means to this business. But we're here in London, and as we talk about what, our, what friction means to our global franchise, you know, we are, we are responding to working through 
how do we remove as much of that friction as possible in the, in the different ways that it manifests for our customers and their customers? How do they transfer money more effectively? How do they, how do they make payment in a more seamless and a, and a more effective way? So we'll come on to that in a little bit more detail. Um, but as much as anything else, we have to keep up. The world really is changing. You know, no longer is it acceptable to operate in with, with opaqueness. No longer is it acceptable to, um, to, to think about, well, purely in terms of time. You know, cost is an interesting one, right? I think where there is an opportunity to define where value exists, then we need to think about how do we, how do we maximize the value that's on offer to, to us, particularly as an industry. Not everything has to be cheap. For, for us, the core is identifying and knowing where value really does exist and to be able to go and exploit that value proposition. But rather than talking about necessarily everything has to be quick, I think what is clear, whether, whether we go to talk to a money transfer operator, whether we go to talk to a bank, whether we go to talk to a B2B network, whether we go and talk to a corporate, what is common about the evolving need for all of, for all of these stakeholders is the need for predictability and certainty. Predictability in terms of people don't necessarily care how quickly something gets there, but they want clarity in terms of what their expectations should be and how to manage them. So a year ago, I was living in the US, um, transferring back money to the UK so my wife could come back and unnecessarily redecorate our house, put new carpets everywhere, put new internal doors everywhere. So go online to my bank. Now, first mistake, I went to my bank. Um, and so I was working for Swift. Right. I was responsible for rolling out GPI. So my bank, I knew, was one of the prime adopters of GPI in the US. And the bank that I was sending money to in the UK I also know had gone live on GPI. I was thinking, this is going to be phenomenal. I know how quickly this thing moves. I'll be able to log on to my bank at the end of the day and see the money's there. Day one, nothing. Day two, nothing. Day three, nothing. Day four, nothing. Day five, it had turned up. But in that period of time, all I was thinking was, damn, my wife's not going to be able to, be able to start this decorating project as quickly as she would like. But also thinking, it's a lot of money for me to sit in the ether and not know what's happened to it, with no transparency, with no predictability around, around, uh, around the delivery of that. And that's not acceptable. Um, it's not acceptable for me. It's not acceptable for businesses. It's not acceptable for, for you facing off to your clients. So that's where we talk about predictability. It's not necessarily about how quickly something gets there. But if you make a commitment to say something should be there with value today, it should be there with value today. And when we think about our cross-border franchise, something like 90% of our payments are actually credited with same-day value. And for everything else, we, we clearly outline in, that, in a service level when payments will arrive. So, so the next point is certainty. And having certainty up front around what, your, what value is going to be credited to your beneficiary destination is, is paramount. Right? That's not just the case for you know, corporates. It's more important for, for us as individuals. Um, and that's one of the reasons why actually card alone can never, can never just be the answer. Right? Not having certainty and clarity up front necessarily on what that exchange rate looks like is not appropriate. We have to lock that in at the point that that payment is initiated. So, so that's, where, that's what grounds all of our thinking in cross-border payments is predictability and certainty. And how do we help solve problems. So when we talk about the frictionless future, what do we mean? Well, we, we summarize that under five core areas. Intuitive payments, um, just-in-time business, seamless cross-border, um, to democratize access for money, and, and, and a real emphasis on you know, combating fraud and financial crime. At the core of any institution's business, increasingly, is, 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 is not the, it, and what people are fighting against and what really drives challenge into everybody's business is, is fraud, it is cybercrime, it is 
re adhering to regulation. And so, you know, as we think about the build out of our services that we will white label, that we will democratize access to, that will drive, you know, commoditized access to, or access to increasingly commoditized rails, they're the core things that underpin our future and how we believe we can service, you know, the broader community beyond what is just at the core of MasterCard. At the core of MasterCard are banks, right? Strip out merchants, strip out individuals. At the core of what we are is an interbank network. What things like, what transactions like Transvast allow us to do is to broaden our relevance beyond purely the banks, but also to money transfer operators, to the telcos, um, and beyond. And, it, and in some cases, thinking about how do we service segments of the community that aren't serviced well today by, by, by the services that banks are able to offer. So, so that's how we're evolving. So how does that come together? And what do we think, and how does that come together, particularly from a cross-border perspective? So at our core, if we think about the overlap in our, in our symbol, um, in the simplest possible terms, you know, the, the, the problem statement is, how do I get money from A to B? We have access to a very broad range of distribution networks, whether that's card, whether that's to accounts, whether that's to mobile wallets, whether that's to cash, or whether that's to a different distribution channel that may yet be available, may yet not be available. So, you know, we're not going to talk about Libra today. I'm not going to talk about Libra, but Libra could be part of that channel. Um, if we start from a place of saying, I need to get money from A to B, what we are developing at the core of our proposition is the ability to say, what drives, what drives that decision? Is it speed? Is it cost? Is it risk? And we can determine then what is the best way to get funds into the market or to the beneficiary. So we, are, we can also take a much more granular view and say, you know, if, your own, if all you require is access to account, if all you require is access to cash out capability, we can drive that capability too. We can take the, the core assets that make up our service, whether that's licensing, whether that's contractual frameworks, whether that's FX, settlement liquidity, the network access, whether that's value-added services, they can all come together around one central construct. And we can make different of those services available to customers to facilitate and meet each and every one of their needs for money transfer. I think what that boils down to and what that manifests to is how do we take out and try to take out the complexity that is involved of operating in this space. The complexity for many of you of having to build out proprietary networks, the cost that comes with having to build out proprietary networks. How do we, how do we commoditize that to you in a way that is accessible to everybody that allows you to be able to have more certainty around the, the delivery of your service and by certainty, could mean in pricing power. How do, we, how do we increasingly transfer the scale that we generate to you as our consumers and our customers? Um, and, and I touched on scale. So to be, for us, our view is to be, for MasterCard to be relevant in this business, we have to find the way to deliver unparalleled scale to deliver access to rails, to deliver access to services that are accessible to the broadest range of, of our community and our stakeholders that allows them to transform the way and allows you to transform the way that you do business. And I think at the core, that's generally where we believe that MasterCard can add value into the cross-border payment space. Not just MasterCard, Visa as well. You know, any of those network type players, the opportunity is to transform the way that you engage with your customer. Mohit, you asked the question earlier, you know, who wins in this space? Is it the infrastructure provider or is it the person who owns the customer? You know, increasingly, and you talked about de-risking, only the customer is increasingly visible to everybody in the value chain in the payment space. Not everybody wants to own the end customer. Um, 
Uh, and actually, you know, we don't want to own we don't want to own certain types of end customer in particular. So, so I think there is a there is a key opportunity and a strategic opportunity to think about the own the, that question again of customer ownership versus infrastructure ownership, and clearly defining the rules and the parameters under which we play. But it is very difficult, and it is increasingly difficult, to keep those things in a vacuum and think about customer only in one silo. So that's MasterCard's view on cross-border payments. I think, Mohit, you've got some questions. And we're happy to take questions from anybody else in the audience. So thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Stephen, that was fantastic. So start thinking of questions, please, but I'll kick it off. Um, you just touched on, uh, on Libra. You've obviously announced a strategic partnership with R3. You're building these rails. I'm just curious to see, where do you see blockchain coming into, into that? Is there a sort of view that MasterCard has as to the role blockchain can play as you build these rails out? Um, so, so we did announce a partnership with R3. Um, and that's very much centered around, at this point, how do, we, how do we take something that is a very highly commoditized corridor, where it's very difficult to make money, um, and think about a more efficient way of being able to deliver access to real-time payments utilizing a different technology, the, the connectivity point between two real-time payment platforms. So, so like everybody, and it feels like this question of blockchain, I'm not sure the answer has necessarily changed very much in the last five years that we've all been talking about it, we're all, we are continuing to, be, to dig down to see where the technology can add value, and if the technology can add value, and when will it add value. Right, right now, there are very few things that are broken about the way that we do business. But, you know, it, coming back to the infrastructure versus customer point, data is increasingly important. Is there a more effective way to be able to manage data on a particular individual? Is there a more effective way to be able to determine and validate that you know, you've made payment to this particular account at a point in time, and it's a good account, and that data could be held in a way that actually democratizes access to that to everybody, so we don't have to continue to go through a process of everybody in the value chain needing to perform sanction screening and AML AML testing and validation and reporting and everything that hangs off the back of that. There, there is probably a way, I think, to actually use blockchain in a far more effective way than current processes and practices deploy today. Now, you know, this is a Stephen Granger view of the world, not a, a MasterCard view of the world. If, we're, if, we are, if we're not careful, we can define everything we do by the technology solutions that, that pop up around us. At the end of the day, we still have to think through what is the problem we're trying to solve for um, and, and use, the, use the technology in a measured way to be able to help solve for those particular challenges. Trying to take technology and say outright, this is the answer and everything else is broken isn't true. Now, you know, I used to work at Swift, you know, dealing with all the noise that comes up and, you know, Swift is old and correspondent banking is bad. Correspondent banking isn't bad. Swift isn't slow and Swift isn't expensive. But correspondent banking doesn't work particularly well for low-value payments. You know, that's not, that isn't my view. That is, you go and talk to every organization I spoke to at Cyboss last week, every single one of them has a problem with low-value payments in highly commoditized corridors, in in hard to reach corridors. And so, you know, we have to think about how do, we, how do we solve for that? How do banks solve for that without seeing those constant outflows that go to transfer wise's bank account, wherever that might be for any particular currency? You know, these guys have got the customer, but they're losing that customer interaction by not being able to service them in an effective way. Um, and now, to some extent, the genie's out of the bag, right? So, you know, it's very hard for these guys to come back and, set and work out how do they win that flow again. Um, but they're not giving up on it. Uh, and technology, technology does have an important role to play. Now, you know, we talk about API. I mean, APIs have been around forever, 
right? But we think about them as being this new, more, more accessible bit of technology. But still, it's very hard for many organizations to actually deploy APIs as part of their core service offering wherever it comes to hit their core infrastructure. Now, you know, that's, the, that's the fundamental challenge. How do you go from saying blockchain's the answer up here to here's this really accessible bit of technology that still is really hard to go and deploy in an effective way? So innovation starts with you know, the problem, thinking through the problem and the right articulation of the problem, and then getting to the point of determining what the answer might be. Not here's a brand new piece of technology and and I'm still trying to find the solution that it's going to go and solve for. So I think we're in control of innovation, and we're in control of how we deploy that technology, and that's the way it has to be, rather than thinking that technology is going to define the answer. Thank you. We'll open it up for questions. Surely the coffee would have kicked in by now. Okay. You can ask anything. Oh, we have you can ask anything. Wow. She's Apart from sweating Libra. right over there. <laughs> Your handler is. Thanks. Uh, Stephen, hi. This is Anant. Um, could you talk a little bit about how the MasterCard Send platform kind of ties in with everything that you just spoke of? Yep. So, so when, I, when you say send, do you mean the send card proposition or the cross-border send proposition? The cross-border send. Cross-border send. So... So SEND cross-border has always been focused predominantly around how do we service banks, right? That has been MasterCard's proposition to go to deliver a bank-appropriate solution that is, at its core, agnostic. You know, it's use case agnostic. It's not built purely to service P2P. It's not built purely to service B2B. It's, it's designed to be able to go and support a whole range of use cases that come together at that core infrastructure layer. With Transvast, we've acquired another platform. What we've also acquired through Transvast are a whole range of capabilities that are increasingly important to how we think about the delivery of a cross-border payment service. So whether that's network, whether that's compliance capabilities, whether it's a broader licensing footprint, um, they are, we're working through now how we bring together the transvast capabilities, the send cross-border capabilities, how do we take the momentum and the real momentum that has actually been generated through with send cross-border in recent, over the course of the last year, and marry that with the existing capabilities that, it, that transvast bring to the table. So, you know, I think the more interesting dynamic about what transvast allows us to do is to step outside of a world that is, we only service banks, to a world where we can say, actually, we can service a much broader range of institutions because MasterCard is licensed, because MasterCard, because Transvast is licensed in a way to be able to go and originate activity from non-licensed institutions. That's the real opportunity, I think, whether that's directly with, you know, the MTO sets, with the MTO clients that, and the MTN clients that um, Transvast brings, or whether it's taking the ability to be able to go and service digital platforms and e-commerce platforms which are also customers of MasterCard. But you know, when you start from a world of card, you know, if card defines your service proposition, which it has to some greater or lesser extent, it does limit then the type of customers that you can go to go, to go and engage with. So you know, really, in its most simplest form, Transvast helps, helps deliver simplicity to our overall service offering. It, it delivers breadth to our overall service offering and delivers a much broader range of capabilities to go and serve the stakeholders that sit in front of us. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, just one last one, Stephen, then we'll let you go. So if I'm sitting in this room listening to that, and you know, some of these, you didn't put up HomeSend logo there, but they're connected to HomeSend, they're connected to Transfers. I mean, how do I connect to MasterCard going forward? Is it a single API that gives me the range of services? Yep. Um, what would be the best way to yeah. approach that? So, so right. I, we talked, I talked a little bit earlier about APIs. You know, and still, depending on who your customer is, API may or may not be the right, the right integration point. 
What we have within the MasterCard cross-border payment services construct is a whole range of capabilities, whether they're provided by the card franchise, pushing payments to card domestically and cross-border, whether that's home send, whether that's transfast, whether that's send cross-border. We're bringing together all of those under one overarching banner, right? MasterCard cross-border payment services that allows us to be able to go and service that broader range of customers. We'll take access to those services can be defined by a single API. We can take, we will take swift messaging. We'll take files depending on the customer and what they want to use the service for. To drive scale, I think we have to be a little bit less prescriptive around what the opportunity is, particularly in a world where, where we increasingly want to deal with firms and intermediaries rather than the end consumer. The end consumer is not our, is not our core business model. So, you know, but we still have to simplify the interaction in a way that makes sense for those organizations that sit around our services to consume those services in the most effective way. If I talk to, if I talk to a bank about being able to take a SWIFT instruction, you know, they're already paying out a lot of money to support their, their SWIFT infrastructure. You know, and whether SWIFT for payments, whether you still need SWIFT for payments or not is, is irrelevant. You still need SWIFT to be able to move securities. You still need SWIFT to be able to go and help support on trade and letters of credit. So that infrastructure is not going anywhere. So the more you can actually use that to be able to access other networks and other service offerings, the more benefit that brings back to, to a type of institution. Somebody else needs a very data-rich interaction with their end customer, and that will ultimately be defined by API. So we, we would deliver a single integration point and a single API for clients who want to be able to go and use that point to access any of the services um, and any of the distribution channels that we have access and provide access to today. Great. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was just fantastic. Thank you for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Granger.